Well, good afternoon. I have been on a journey of discovery and transformation for the past five years, and I'm so excited to be here to tell you a little bit about it today in the hopes that you will take my message back from wherever you come to use it to help improve the quality of life for yourself and in the communities that you call home. I have, for the past five years, been the lead consultant on a project that is transforming the way that I and people around the world are thinking about the role of place, not only to our basic humanity, but to the economic development of the places that we live. The Night Soul of the Community Project, in partnership with the Gallup organization, asks some very simple but incredibly profound questions about place. Namely, what makes people love where they live, and why does it matter? When um, my five-year-old Grace, who is with us today, asked me, what is it that you do, Mommy? And I explained to her, soul of the community, she said, oh, you're a city doctor. And I said, yes, I like that. I am a city doctor. And her understanding of what Mommy does has improved because when she was three, she asked me, what I did, and I tried to explain soul of the community, and she said, oh, you work with dead places. <laughs> Luckily, she is advancing in her understanding of what it is mommy does. So the transforming discovery was the answer to these questions that I told you a few minutes ago, and that is, of the 10 areas we studied about places, social offerings, social life, aesthetics, the beauty of the place, and openness, the welcomeness that people feel in a place, matter most to make people loving where they live, something we call community attachment. And the more people love where they live, the higher the local economic growth of that place. So we went from something really squishy, love of place, to something pretty hard, economic outcomes. This was true in 26 cities over three years, 43,000 people that we talked to. Rich cities, poor neighborhoods, the findings were consistently clear. It seems that today we as humans crave from our cities places for social interaction in a place that we can look around and be proud of where we think everybody must feel comfortable in their own skin. And when we get that from our place, we make economic choices that help the bottom line of that community. We are more satisfied with our jobs. We're more entrepreneurial. We're more productive at work. We spend more time in our communities, and we encourage others to come and visit us there instead of taking the plane out of there the first chance we get. But you should really think about that because what you show off about your place when people come to visit you is what attaches you to it today. And I don't know about you, but when people come and visit me, I don't hand them the want ads across the breakfast table and say, look, look at our economy. Aren't we doing great? No. I take them to show them the place, show them what we have to do there, show them how nice the people are, show them how pretty it is. And because of that, the economic choices and the benefits from that come later. This, together with the Soul of the Community Project, really provides strong empirical evidence of this growing movement that we've all been telling you about this afternoon called placemaking. And placemaking is about putting your place central in your conversations. But it's also something else that I need to make very clear. This is not about all places looking the same. It's not about that. It's not even about changing who you are as a place. It's about being who you are as a place but being the best who you are that you can be. It's about knowing your narrative and identity as a place 
and optimizing that. So people can be drawn to your city's unique take on social offerings, on aesthetics, and on openness. So that people can bond to your soul as a place, which in turn may help fuel your local economy. Now, not every place has to be New York City to attract these little economic engines. Not every place needs to be that way. Ask Raleigh, North Carolina. Ask Boulder, Colorado. Ask Long Beach, California. <laughs> place matters to these folks who are wooing at me more than ever. Place. We are dealing with the first generation who are saying in record numbers, I will choose a place over a job. I will, get, I will not take the dream job to live in the place I really want to live. I'm a parent. We're not talking about that being a smart idea. We're talking about that being the way that young people are thinking today. Place matters most. And yet, young people are perceived to be one of the least welcome groups in every place we study. <laughs> every single year. Why is that? Why would young talent be perceived as less welcome than immigrants, than gays and lesbians? It's all terrible, but why does young talent always end up at the bottom? Well, something really interesting is happening today. When you ask somebody 30 years and older, is your city welcoming for young talent? The first thing they do to assess that is think about the jobs. Do we have jobs? Do we have good jobs? Are they bad jobs? What about the jobs? When you ask somebody 30 years and younger, is this city welcoming for young talent? The first thing they do to assess that is they think about the place. They think about the place. That's what we call a game changer. Because optimizing place now is becoming central to the attraction and retention of young talent. Now, these guys have been thinking this way for a while. When we talk about business and corporations, economic development, they've been thinking this way for a while. Okay, they don't call it soul of the community, they don't call it placemaking, but they have seen the trend with young talent who are choosing places over jobs. So companies are in the position now of not only having to sell jobs, but to sell places. And they want places that sell themselves. They don't need a hard sell on the place. My friend Mick Cornett, who has been on the show, who is the mayor of Oklahoma City, captures the new reality quite well. Today we are seeing a new paradigm. It's no longer people go where the jobs are. Today people go where they want to live. And the jobs go where the people are. This is the same city not too long ago who tried to attract a major airline to put down roots in their place. So they did the usual. They threw $100 million of tax incentives at them. Come on, here's your tax incentive. And they, the airline said, thank you very much. We just don't see our people living here. <laughs> and as the mayor says, that was a major wake-up call for our city to understand the importance of place. Now, as mayor, he is running one of the largest and one of the most successful publicly funded placemaking initiatives in this country. And, oh, by the way, he's a Republican. If you think placemaking, good placemaking, needs to be political, it's not. If it becomes political, you're doing it wrong. So besides number crunching, which corporations still do, They are starting to show up in cities and towns across this country in deciding where they want to put down roots. And they'll come unannounced to the mayor, unannounced to the Chamber of Commerce, unannounced to all of us. They will show up and they will check out the waterways and they will check out the parks and they will check out the nightlife. And they will go to the Little League game to see how the parents act. 
They will go to the grocery store and see if you say hello when you pass a stranger on the aisle or don't say hello. Maybe even crash their carts into you to see if you say, oh, excuse me, it's my fault, or you lose your life as a result. <laughs> they have even been known to sit at green lights to see how long it takes the guy behind them to start honking. So when you hear your mayor or some public official say, hey guys, um, very important public service announcement, please stop honking at people sitting at green lights, you now know why. It is his economic development strategy. Because that's the kind of thing that's, being, that's happening today. Cities are being judged by a completely different metric than before. We also learned that people who believe their community or their city is on the rise are more likely to be in love with it today. Optimism for place is critical. We saw this in a lot of remarkable ways, Very a lot of communities across the country that we looked at. A couple that I'll share with you. 2009 in Detroit, Michigan. We saw people's attachment, that means their love for their place, go through the roof. We know what was happening in 2009 in Detroit. And yet, people were digging in. It was an important lesson to those of us, I think, who do community work that we probably should take to heart. Perhaps community turnarounds start, they don't end and they're not complete, but perhaps they start in the minds and the hearts of the residents committed to making a place better. Have we leveraged that? Do we pay attention to that? No, we don't. Not as we should. And apparently, we're missing out on some key energy that can really make a difference per, for place. Biloxi, Mississippi, is another community that we study. In the first year of the project, which was 2008, Biloxi, Biloxi had the second highest attachment of the 26 places we studied. And it didn't look too much different still than this. And the, and, and the representation you see there on the sign of people's unwillingness to give up on their place. This is not a picture that inspired optimism maybe for a lot of us. It inspired optimism in Biloxi. And that is another important message from the Soul Project. And that is directly to public leaders. How you talk about your place matters a lot in how people feel about the place. And I have talked to thousands and thousands of people across this country. Nobody is impressed, are we, with the amount of meetings that our leaders attend or the lovely task forces that we create, or how they act in those environments. What we care about is what's going to happen as a result of that work. Where are you taking this place so I can figure out if I'm on this train or not? Inspire me to feel like this place is going to be better tomorrow, and back it up. Show me results. This is how we start to see the power of spirit of place make a big difference in the actuality of how communities succeed or fail when times get tough or any other day of the week. In all of my years of doing community practice and working for foundations and working for myself and running nonprofit organizations and all the things that I have done, I have never seen a model inspire change and help places the way the placemaking model has. Why? Well, I'm working on that, but I have a couple of ideas. Number one, placemaking is a strength-based model. If you understand your narrative and your identity as a place, which is the first step for most places who do this kind of work, you have to start at a place of strengths. You have to start at a place of strength. And I think cities are frankly really tired of hearing chapter and verse about what they're not good at. We get it. 
But if you start at a place of strength with people, not only do you have the identity of your place that you can build on, the soul of your place, but you also have a place to leverage the things you're not doing so great at. And that can be a powerful motivator for change. Whoops, sorry. You don't need to know who I am quite yet. There we go. The other thing that's incredibly powerful about a placemaking model is that if you change people's perceptions of social offerings, openness, and aesthetics, you see same-year differences in attachment. Same-year differences. I've worked in civic engagement and social capital and community mobilization, and I love every bit of them. But I tell you what, you build something, you put a bunch of money in it, it's a delicate house of cards, and you pray five to ten years, you'll see something come out of it. And nothing bad happened in between that knocks the whole thing down. Attachment in place works differently. Because if you can change people's perceptions of those key aspects of their place, people fall more in love with their place that same year. And the economic benefits flow from that. Also, placemaking is incredibly scalable. You don't need a huge initiative to make a huge difference in your place. Often, the ideas that come from residents, the small, simple, cheap ideas, can make a huge difference in how people feel about their place. Putting chairs out in front of a waterfront. Buffalo, New York, created an economic center where there wasn't one before. You create a public space where there hasn't been one before. These can make a huge impact. And once you start seeing that return on investment of these small ideas, you want to do more and more and more. But you can start small. I've also seen the placemaking model completely loosen conversations that seem to be entrenched forever. Forever. I'll give you an example. Development. Do we grow? Do we not grow? It is entrenching communities all across this country, this debate, to the point that communities don't go anywhere because of this fight. But I'll tell you what's at the heart of this. If you have folks on one side that say we have to grow to stay modern, to attract new talent, all of that, and the other people will say, nope, not going to do it. Let me tell you what's at the heart of that. People don't want to sacrifice their soul of a place at the altar of change and growth. That is what's happening there. And if you can make a covenant with your city that says, look, we will know who we are as a place, whatever our soul of our community is, and hold it sacred, maybe even build on it as we grow smart and effective. But you have to know your soul. You have to know your identity as, as a place. What makes you different from other places and build on that. But if you promise to hold that sacred while you continue to grow, you see people exhale. But then don't break your covenant. I am on a mission to make the case for place. I'm on a mission to apply this model in cities all around the globe and to talk about the lessons that I'm learning from around the world as we do this. I am a city doctor, but you can be too. Because love of place is the great equalizer. Makes us no different because we all have personal relationships with our place. And if we can all work together in helping our places grow and be and come into their souls, then it will be key to our own quality of life and potentially for the economic sustainability of the places we call home. Thank you.